Colosseum chapter 9 Dinner and Disaster How can it be that you're going straight into Rome? Guthan asked. We're going in to warn our old teacher to get him out, Nuncio said. A rescue mission, Guthan said. Sounds dangerous. I would think that any follower of Jesus right now would be finding a way to get as far away from Rome as they could. That's what I was doing. Have you been to Rome? Alcom asked. I am from the city of Rome, Guthan confirmed. I was on my way out of this land myself when I was caught. How did you get caught? Canyon asked. I was trying to buy food, he said. A group of Roman soldiers came through and harassed everyone in line. They found me out. How did they know? Alcom asked. They had a little makeshift altar to their god Diana, he said. They were looking for Christians. It's their little test. What test? They make you offer up incense to one of their gods, Guthan said. If you offer up incense, they give you no trouble. But you refused? Yes. They know a real Christian would never do that. Then they taunted me. I set my jaw and confessed my faith when they tested me. I was determined, but they kept offering to me, even when I was in chains. All I had to do was offer a little incense, and I was free to go. Perhaps sun believers have done that. They fear the soldiers and do the offering, Bedell said. Yes, perhaps, Guthan said. But you boys remember what I said about denying Jesus before men, Guthan said, addressing Alcom and Bird. He will deny us, Bird said. Not me, he announced. Do you think that they would have really let you go, Alcom said, if you took their offer? Yes, I think so, Guthan said. But then how will I face Jesus? How will I face him on Judgment Day? Baina tried to imagine that when he said it. What would facing Jesus on Judgment Day really be like? Besides, Guthan continued, it wouldn't surprise me if they were to let me offer incense and then betray me and keep me captive anyway. Then where would I be? In denial of our Messiah and about to be killed as well. Ruin, Alcom said. That sounds like ruin. Not me, Bird said again, brimming with enthusiasm. He had seen the man being whipped and he had feared, but seeing him testify now gave Bird great courage. They are catching us in other ways as well. They have spies, Guthan said. They infiltrate us, pretending to believe. They even learn scripture to blend in. Really, Nuncio said? That is so terrible. It's not all bad, Guthan said. Sometimes it backfires and they come to faith themselves, he said, smiling. The Lord will have his way, Nuncio nodded. Why do they hate us so much, Alcom asked. We don't do anything but help people and love people. It's just so hard to understand. There are a few reasons, Guthan said. If we witness to them, they hate us because we testify that their deeds are evil, just as Jesus said. But so many of them hate us and we haven't even said a thing. Alcom said. They have superstitions, Nuncio added. They think it's our fault when things go wrong because we defy their gods. It's absurd, Alcom said. Just absurd. Yes, Guthan said, it is. But underneath it all is the devil. These people do all their sins and pay homage to their gods and evil spirits come to dwell with them, in them, and around them. And they don't realize it. But it's the evil spirits that hate us, really. Alcom said, understanding, it's the devil hunting us. Yes, Guthan said, and worse, those evil spirits know exactly who we are. Some of these Romans who are filled with evil spirits can spot us without anyone saying a word. Their demons inform them. Then we must pray that the Lord blinds them, Bedell chimed in, because we're going to Rome. Do you know your way around Rome? Nuncio asked Guthan. Yes, he said, I lived there for many years. I sold what little I had and tried to escape. The soldiers took all my money. Now I have nothing. We don't know the city at all, Nuncio said. We've been praying for guidance that we'd be able to find our teacher somehow. What is your teacher's name? Guthan asked. Decimus. I know that man, Guthan said. I know Decimus. I have bought his candles. I have prayed in his basement with him. Can you help us get to him? Nuncio asked, brightening. You know, I'd have to be out of my mind to go to Rome. But my plans to leave are in ruins, all my money gone. Guthan stood up. So I will go with you to Rome. I will take you to him. Glory to God, Nuncio exclaimed, and the group chimed in their thanks to their beautiful Savior and their new friend. My life is forfeit anyway, Guthan said. And without your help, I'd still be in those stocks. 
headed for Rome in the hands of Roman soldiers. Perhaps this way the Lord will make a way for us all to get out in one piece. Perhaps the way out of Rome is by going straight into it. That's absurd too, Alcum said with a smile. I love it. Yes, Guthen said, but then his face turned serious. He turned to Bowen, who had just been baptized. You said yourself that you want to die for Jesus. If we all go to Rome, every one of us just might get their chance. Then let's pray, and the Lord's will be done, Bowen said. Not my will, but thine be done, Lord, Alcum added. They prayed together, every heart resolute. The caravan packed up, and the group headed out. They finally crossed the further bridge they had been forced to go around to. It was bigger and had held up against the stormy deluge. Traffic of other wagons, people, and horses crossed the busy bridge, and they had to wait their turn. The village by the bridge seemed friendly enough, but they decided to avoid the villages and camp in the fields. They had more than enough supplies and wanted to avoid contact with just about anyone, especially after Guthen's warnings. After passing the bridge, more grassy fields and farms opened up on the plains before them. Guthen tried to offer some guidance, since he knew the ter territory a little, whereas the others knew nothing of it. Guthen was trying to lead them to a smaller road ahead that would lead to a stand of trees where they could camp, but as they crested a hill, they came across a large caravan stopped before them. Alcum rode with Canyol and Nuncio in the lead wagon, and they tried to get a good look. It was different than the normal people they had seen. A flag Alcum didn't recognize floated above the last wagon on a pole, and the rigs had strange markings. The wagons were colorful, designs painted on them from some far-off country. Alcum was sure of it as their camels came into view. They had a group of camels, oxen, and all sorts of livestock. It was even bigger than he had first realized. They had a herd of sheep and two dogs hustling around them, keeping them in a group close to the wagons. Men shouted around, speaking loudly to each other in a foreign language, throwing their arms up, apparently arguing about something. They had fabrics wrapped around their heads and big beards. Then Alcum saw the problem. Their largest wagon was missing both its front wheels and was tilting over in the mud, threatening to fall over on its side completely. It looked heavy. Nuncio leapt out of the wagon as they approached and went to go and speak to the men. Most of them did not speak the same language, but one of them did. Can you help us? The big man called out in a funny accent. Help! The man added. He was urgent. Come, Nuncio beckoned, running back. Bring all the men. Get the rope. Bowen was already in action, grabbing rope and tools, and the others hustled over to the rig. Alcum wasn't quite a man yet, but he came to help anyway. Bird stayed back with Baina in the carriage, watching. Nuncio and Bedell went on the tilting side of the huge wagon and pushed back on it, trying to prevent the fall and hoping not to get crushed. Canyol and Guthan held on to the other side along with some of the foreign caravan's men. Bowen unhooked one of the horses from their wagon and brought it over, tying the rope to the wagon and the horse. All the men heaved and the horse pulled and slowly the big wagon groaned and moved off the muddy shoulder, leveling out. The men cheered, relieved. Thank you, thank you, the leader said to Nuncio. Thank you all. We're glad to help, Nuncio said. He looked and saw the big wagon wheels broken away, wrecked. Do you have wheels? Nuncio asked. We only have one more. We have already had to replace three on this journey. Two broken wheels now, but only one spare left. We have a spare, Nuncio said. Maybe it'll work. He wasn't sure of the size. Bowen came up to them. It might work, he said, being more familiar with the Roman rigs. We can try. Thank you, my new friends, the man bellowed. My name is Sadiki. Shalom, Nuncio said. All the men came to greet him. My name is Sadiki, he told them all again. We are going to Rome. He looked at his broken down wagon. I hope so, he added with a smile. We'll help if we can. I'll get the wheel, Bowen said. It was unlikely they would need it anyway, he figured. I buy your wheel. I buy your wheel, he said. Thank you. No need to buy, Nuncio said. We're happy to help. You are good people. Good people, he said. He looked around. Am I in the right country? Romans helping us? He joked. Sure, Nuncio said. It was close enough. They got the wheel out, and it was a fit. They got the other one, and all the men teamed up to install the big wheels. They had to offload some supplies inside to make it possible, and it took every last one of them and all Siddiqui's men, but they got it done. 
Only Siddiqui spoke their language, making it harder. He barked orders at his servants and tried to manage the horses that were leading it. Now you are ready to go to Rome, Nuncio said, wiping his hands. You good people, Siddiqui said. I pay you. He offered them him a small pouch. No need for that, Nuncio said. Siddiqui looked offended and confused. Bowen tried to recover for Nuncio. Please, sir, instead of money, perhaps we can eat with you tonight? Siddiqui brightened at that. Yes, yes, come eat with us. Come, eat, wine. Abena and Bird had gotten out, and Siddiqui greeted them too. Lady, so wonderful to meet you, he said to Bena. We drink wine tonight. Lady Bena smiled graciously. And your boy, he indicated to Bird. Pleased to meet you, sir, Bird said, offering his good hand. You, you, Siddiqui, shouted to one of his men. We eat tonight, we feast. The man said something back in his language and scurried off. We eat tonight, he said again. We kill us a lamb. A prudent man, came the breathless reply. A prudent man what? Ramiro called back. A prudent man sees the evil and hides himself, came the reply. Come, come, Ramiro called. A woman rounded the corner, carrying a little lamp, and several bags laden upon her back. She knelt down and lowered them to the floor. What hour is it? What, what's wrong? Ramiro asked. She wasn't breathless just from the burden. She had been running. I had to hurry, she said. Roman soldiers are in the village. Everyone in the little room stiffened at that, now wide awake. Demika tried to collect herself after having a deep sleep that had been eluding her for days. Soldiers? How many? Ramiro asked. I don't know. Eight, maybe ten. They're looking for Christians. Did anyone see you come to us? Ramiro asked. No, it's early morning. The sun is not up yet. I have to get back before light so no one knows I was gone. Chaya took the bags from the woman and sorted through them. Thank you, she said. Thank you so much. I don't know if I can bring anything again for a while, the woman said. The soldiers are watching. They're looking for anyone who might be helping followers escape or hide. It's like they know, she said. Thank you, Romero said. It's, it's all right. We should be supplied for a while. We'll be careful not to eat much and make it last. I almost forgot, the woman said, pulling a pouch out, a wineskin. This is the last of our olive oil for now until the harvest finishes. She handed it to Chaya. Thank you, Chaya said. I have to go. I have to go, the anxious woman said. Chaya embraced her in a hug, and Ramiro got up and took her hands. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, he told her. Thank you, she said. God bless you all. I have to go. And with that, she took her lamp and disappeared into the darkness. Ramiro lit their main lamp as the group stirred and began talking. Is it safe here? Avita said. Are we still safe? We'll be safe, Ramiro said. This is a dangerous time, but the Lord has hidden us away so far. We'll keep praying. Can we pray now? Little Junia asked. The whole group felt the anxiety of the woman who had just come. Of course, Ramiro said. And they all prayed together, giving thanks for the Lord's provision and protection. Damika thought about that. It was hard to imagine giving thanks for being forced to dwell in a horrible underground tunnel where bodies were buried all around in sarcophagi. Yet she was glad for shelter and hiding and to have Baldrick with her. There was such a kindness to him. She felt for his pain of having been betrayed. The group ate an early breakfast and discussed what their next move might be. The harvest has started, Chaya said. That means that many of the trees will not have their fruits on them much longer. We should try to gather as much as we can on our own. I'm not sure if that's wise, Ramiro replied. If Roman soldiers are nearby, it might be us that gets harvested. We can go the other way, Junia offered. The other entrance I found. It's much further away, Chaya said, but that might be a good thing in this case. There are olives and figs there too, Junia said, and water. Good hiding places too. Who will go? We have two here that are crippled and three that are too old, Ramiro said. Who is willing? I will go with Junia, Avita, her mother said. We're a good team. I will go, Baldrick said. I can carry a lot. He felt Damika tug on his arm. She didn't want him to go. She had hoped he would not volunteer. It's okay, he assured her. You can stay here. We'll be swift. I don't want that, she said. I'll go with you. She did not want to, as she was still worn with fatigue, but getting out of the dark tunnels for a while would be a good thing. You stay here, Baldrick told Demika. We'll be back. That was no good. 
I want to go where you go, Damika said. I will go with you. Anyone else, Ramiro asked. I will go tonight, one of them said. A few others chimed in. They were more familiar with the nearer entrance. Then let's go before it gets too hot, Avita said. The four of them gathered their things and some bags for loading the figs and olives. Chaya filled Damika's lamp with oil and gave her a flint to light it. Then she handed over the bag of oil the woman had just brought to them. You need to be sure to have plenty of oil, Chaya said. This is more than enough. I just want you to have it just in case. Thank you, Damika said. She wanted no part in walking in total darkness again, with no oil for the lamp. Be careful, be praying, Ramiro said, shaking Baldric's hand. Don't be long. Thank you, brother, Baldric said. We'll see you soon. The four headed out in a different direction than they had come from. Junia led the way, holding Damika's lamp. Hold hands, Junia said. Some of these passages are small. We don't want to lose anyone. Damika was fine with that and took Baldric's hand and then Avita. Baldric was the last in the chain. They carefully winded through more creepy, awful tunnels. The little light was better than no light, but it was still mostly dark and gloomy. The four of them finally emerged in a pleasant area in the morning sun, seeming worlds brighter after the tunnels. They quickly gathered up as much as they could. They saw people far off in the distance, but no one was disturbing the area or taking from their trees, so they took freely. They gathered all they could and headed back into the cemeteries. Damika felt less afraid since she kept praying and holding to Baldric. But still, it was depressing after enjoying the sunlight. The opening was not as wide, and the tunnels were narrower than the other entrance. They wound slowly back, little Junia leading the way. It was further, but not too much. Then came the noise. What is that? Avita asked. They all froze. What is that? Damika echoed. Then Junia spoke up. Everyone come together close. Hold tight, the four of them did what the little girl said. They kept trying to understand what they were hearing. Then came the voices. Junia held up the lamp and blew out the light. They listened in pitch blackness. It was no longer a mystery. You! Get them! Get them! A voice shouted. Metal clattered. Two torches could be seen way down the main tunnel. They were near their camp. Screams pierced the darkness and more yelling. Junia scooted them around a corner away from the main tunnel. No one said a word. More screaming. More metal. They could not make out many words, but the words were ugly. Every single sound was ugly. Overrun by a Roman raid, their camp was a loss. All they had now was each other and whatever gear they had on. They would never see their friends again. Damika felt an awful agony in her gut. Surely they all did. She was grateful. Had it come ten minutes later, they would have been in Roman hands themselves. And Baldrick was with her. The blackness of the tunnels began to close in on her, their lamp being snuffed out as though it were hope itself. She began to struggle to breathe. Come, Junia whispered. Hold tight. Follow me. They dared not even reply as they clung to each other in despair. I will lead us out, the little girl said. There was no going back.